All right, we're here again at um, Turn 2 Brewery. This time with Ray Sterbone. Thanks for joining us, Ray. Thank you, Jim. And uh, before we get going, I just want to <laughs> tell you, if you haven't been here to Turn 2, uh, great place to come have a beer. They uh, Behind us, you can see all these vats. They make a bunch of their own beer here, and they've got some other uh, craft beer here that they don't make that's also available. But if you're the kind of guy who likes, a, or woman, who likes a nice craft beer, this is the place to be. So, without further ado, as I said, this is Racer Bone. He's a local legend, and we're going to talk to him about uh, his music and what he's been up to. Uh, first of all, I want to say uh, about Ray. I met Ray, uh, what was it? That was five or six years ago, you at think? At least five years ago. Met him at, a, uh, at, at Brewster's. For those of you who are around here, you'll remember Brewster's Coffee Shop. But uh, he was uh, there doing a, uh, a um, uh, open mic. Open mic. I forgot what they wore for a minute. And anyway, he played this song uh, that just blew me away. And we're going to get to that song and talk about it. I think he's even going to play it today. But uh, there's a song called uh, Blue Cross. It has this really cool haunting guitar line. And it stayed with me. Um, then just to back up a little bit, I've always been a metalhead my whole life, as you know. Yeah. And uh, I wasn't really into singer-songwriter stuff, but that song got me hooked, and I now credit Ray along with, um, of course, Gillian Welch. Gillian Welch and Racer Bone taught me to appreciate the singer-songwriter gift and the storytelling that's involved in. So anyway, I, I became a Racer Bone fan mostly. Well, I want to clarify this. I, I've never really done any songwriting with Killian Welch. All right. Although, I didn't mean Killian, that. if you're out there, I'd love to. <laughs> yeah, I didn't mean to say you're right with her, but I mean, them together as separate artists. So anyway, so I, I uh, sat up and paid attention to Ray over that, and uh, as time has gone on, I found out uh, this guy is, uh, one of his gifts is painting a picture with words. Thank you. I could say, uh, growing up listening to metal, I didn't always care so much if I understood the words or not. But then uh, you started telling stories, and one song I really love of yours, Steel on Wood, yeah. which pretty much tells the story of Ray's, uh, how he got into this business. And I'm going to let him talk about that, but the listening to that, to me that's like uh, when you talk about the train going into the city and you're going to the pawn shop. Yeah. I see that in my head while I'm listening to that. It's like there's a video. I can see you on the subway going into... It was New York City, right? Yes, it was. And I see you coming home with this raggedy ass cheap guitar and you're all psyched about it. And the strings are this far off the neck and all that. But anyway, it's a cool story and I like that. And it's like, I, I, so thank you. You finally got me to the point where I appreciate a good story. It doesn't always have to be screaming and angry guys in leather singing about death. <laughs> There's another part to the world to be appreciated. You don't like angry guys in leather? <laughs> oh yeah, sometimes, I gotta be in the mood. Depends on how much beer I've had. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that uh, okay. song, like you said, that "Steel on Wood" is um, it's all true. When I and, and when I first moved here to Florida back in um, '09, I got involved with the ACMA down in Fort Myers, and um, their big thing is original music, promoting it and promoting writing it and sharing the skills and. Um, critiquing, helping other people, right? And ACMA is? Is the Americana Community Music Association. Okay. Um, they're real big now. We, we have grown. I Myself and my wife are founding members, or amongst the founding members. But um, they said to me at that point, um, well, this is all about original music, so you, you have to write. And I went, but there are so many songs out there that nobody's playing. Why do I have to create more? And they said, well, try it. And I did, and that was one of the first songs that I wrote, um, and it's all true. My buddy and I, my buddy Ralph, I used to go to his house, and he was in the School of Visual Arts in Manhattan, and I used to go to his house, and he had an old gut string guitar sitting in the corner. Um, I'd pick it up and mess with it and do the one note Lines, right. And he'd pick it up and play all the bogus chords that he knew, which didn't make any sense. And he, but still, he was teaching me some of the basics: G chord, C chord. And finally, I said, "Got to have my own guitar." And he goes, "We, we got to get down to Manhattan." And we did. We got in a got in a car, drove to the train station, got in the train, and off to Music Row down in Manhattan. Which uh, anybody old enough to remember Music Row? 
it was the place to go. You'd run into, you, at any given time in any of those stores, you'd run into your stars, folk stars, rock stars, Hendrix, and, and people like that would just stroll on in there and start playing guitars. It was amazing, absolutely amazing. So we went down there and um, I played a mess of guitars. I had $15 in my pocket. And there wasn't one guitar I could buy, so we, we kept going. You didn't get a Martin? No, no, no Martin. There was no Martin in my immediate future. Um, the places were called Manny's, Rudy's. The very first Sam Ash was there. And uh, again, I played a mess of guitars here and nothing. We, um, we packed it up and headed up uptown a little bit to where the pawn shops were. And that's where I grabbed my first guitar. And like you said, the action was about that high and there was an additional hole in the guitar, somebody that hit it with a hammer. And he, he, he gave it to me for 10 bucks with a cardboard case, an old beat up cardboard case. And I carried that thing home in the train and spent hours and hours playing that before I finally put together enough money to go back down there and buy my first real six string, which at the time was a Fender, Kingman was the model. It was a big dreadnought guitar, rosewood and, and uh, spruce. And I really liked that guitar. I used to put that on the back of my Harley Davidson ride all over the place with it, play it on the beach, played it everywhere. It went everywhere with me. But um, that song tells a story of me going downtown and getting that first guitar. So was your first guitar, was it even a name brand or was it just some I, Korean guitar? You know, I don't even remember and I wish I still had it because just for remembrance but I don't there was no name on the headstock we used to call them Spanish guitars they were gut string guitars nylon string but um, I don't remember the name of that guitar I don't remember who, who it was by I just remember 10 bucks so well, you know it wasn't that much of a guitar right yeah <laughs> so just for the sake of, I mean, I know most of this because we've had so many conversations in the past, mm -hmm. but for the sake of people who don't know, who might be watching this, let's back all the way up to the beginning. Oh. How did you even get interested in music to start? I was a big fan of, of folky music um, and not just the standards. Um, folks like Eric Anderson, uh, Rick Von Schmidt, Dave Van Ronk, who did a lot of country blues as well as folk. And some of the the, the people in the fringes. And back then, the people in the fringes were cutting records. And, and what years are we talking like, about here? We're talking about um, 64, 65. That's okay. 1964, okay. 65. <laughs> and um, I really liked that music and I wanted to play it. And uh, back then there was no internet, there was no YouTube. There was none of that. You wanted to play this, you had to have the record, learn the song, and you could buy books. Mm -hmm. So that's what happened to me after I got that first guitar. In fact, I was playing, I was learning so many Bob Dylan songs back then, my friends were calling me Ray Bob, just for yeah. fun. Right. And, uh, but they enjoyed having me around because I was the one on the beach playing the music. And does, um, does that folky music back in those days get you the girls? No. Really? <laughs> no. I would have thought so. Not really. They gathered round and listened and all that, but it wasn't what people thought. Okay. Not really. So, um, all right, you started out in the mid-60s. You did a lot of other stuff though, right? I mean, you didn't just, in the mid-60s, that would have put you around what, in your 20s? In the mid-60s, no. I graduated high school in 67, so that okay. put me 15, All right. 14, I would just 15, guess 16. I didn't do the math in my head, I was just yeah, throwing a number no, out. I was about <laughs> 15, 16 years old when I first started out. And I was into a few things, I was into motorcycles, a lot into motorcycles and hot rods uh, back then. That was some of my favorite stuff, also hunting and fishing. So what all were you doing? What kind of stuff do you do before you... Uh and tell us, yeah, start here about what you did for a living, up, and then up until you decided music was going to be your thing. Well, 
When I get out of high school, I, I, um, it was the time of the Vietnam War. And at first I said, well, I don't know if I want to go there and, in the mud. So I was trying to join the Navy or the Coast Guard, and I ended up in the Coast Guard. And six months in to the Coast Guard, I was trying to get over to Vietnam for river patrol. And that was actually a waiting list, believe it or not. Shit, really? Yeah, and I got myself on a waiting list, but I never, never got called. So I did my stint in the Coast Guard and um, got damaged while I was in there. So they put me out a little early because of injuries. And then I got out of there and kind of drifted around a little bit. I was playing music, but I was not inspired. There was no real inspiration. I wasn't with a band. I wasn't doing too much on my own. I was just dabbling and noodling and playing. And I was trying to write stuff. I wrote essays, short stories, and stuff like that. Nothing, nothing big. And I worked around mechanics for a long time. And then I decided I needed more. I got married, and I realized there was no future in what I was doing. So uh, at my father's urging. And I thank him all the time. Thanks, Dad. I went and took a police test and placed high, passed my physical. Next thing I know, I was in a blue uniform, walking this around. New York? No, in uh, Westchester County, okay. New York. Um, smaller department, okay. but I spent my time in there and um, did my thing. A lot of stories come out of that. In fact, I wrote a song that um, that kind of tells one story from the Coast Guard and one story from the police department. Uh, something that something that happened. Uh, I wrote it for an outfit called Hero Song. They're they're based in uh, Fort Myers. Julian Sumby does that and um, takes veterans, first responders, people that have a story to tell like that, and they write their song and record it, and then he puts it out there. Pretty, pretty cool stuff. You're gonna, you're gonna play that one, aren't you? Uh, I might play that one for you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You want I know you want to hear something else, and, and well, yeah. we we'll got room we for have two. time for it. Yeah. <laughs> we have time for it. We'll do both. So that's where it went. And after the police department, uh, I came out, and um, due to the injury, I wasn't going back to work. So uh, I ended up. My son was born right about the time I got out of the police department, and I ended up staying home playing Mr. Mom for five straight years. Uh, while my ex-wife worked, uh, she went to work and I would take care of the house, take care of the kid, do, do the food cooking and et cetera, et cetera, basic Mr. Mom stuff. And uh, when I had time, I'd pick up the guitar and play. Uh, a different scene up there musically. I was not in New York City, I was kind of out in the sticks and the boonies. and There wasn't a whole lot going on for singer-songwriters then and I wasn't writing them. So where are we at right now in timeline year-wise? Where are we at? Uh, in we're like in the early 90s. Okay. We've skipped right over all that stuff. That kind of is a blur between the military and, and the police department. That whole time of my life kind of zipped on by. A lot, a lot happened. Um, some of which I would share, some of which I would not share. Mm -hmm. I just don't need to share it and uh, don't want to relive it. But uh, it all became part of me, as far as that goes. Uh, but now, well, where do you want us to be now? Well, okay, let's just make sure we got everything here. So after the after you got out of the police department, mm -hmm. is that when you decided, I'm gonna get a little more serious about music? I tried to, but that's when I was taking care of my son. Um, I went through, after he got into, got into school, it wasn't long after that. I get into a bad place, which I don't discuss too much. Okay. Uh, kind of drove me into a depression, et cetera, et cetera. And it was a bad time. Uh, but hell, to me, the good times, the not so good times, the really bad times, it makes you who you are. Right. I you agree. come out of it, you, you, it all goes in there, and then it makes you that person that you are. And I was very lucky that I came out of it being a better person, not a, I didn't fall completely through the cracks, so it did take me there. And then, and there was a time there that I just don't like to think about, quite a few years. Uh, and then I finally decided I had enough 
and got out of New York and came down here. And that is when I really started getting serious about the music. When you came down here to Highlands I got County? Down a, no, I got down to Florida. Okay, I was living that's right. in um, Cape Coral. Yeah, that's right. You were further south yeah. originally. I was in Cape Coral and um, started messing around with the music again. And that's when I met my wife now. And uh, she, came over, she came over to the house and I hadn't really been playing. And she noticed the guitar case sitting there. And she goes, oh, you play guitar? And I didn't really know how much into music she was. But um, I said, yeah, she goes, well, play me something. And I said, well, it's been a long time, so why don't we just save that for next time? So she went home, and then I spent one week on that guitar just brushing up two or three <laughs> songs. And she came over, and I played the two or three songs, and she goes, actually, she goes, i got to tell you pretty good. I said, well, really? I said, or you just blowing smoke. She goes, no, I know music. My, her ex was a bass player. He played with some big names. He played in a band. Um, she had a lot of friends down at Fort Myers in the music circle, singer-songwriters. She invited one of them up to the house. And we um, we got together. And he was turned out to be a nice guy. I was expecting a lot of ego coming through that door. Yeah. But he ended up being a real nice guy and um, told me, you need to leave the guitar out, not put it away, so that every time you walk by that guitar, it calls you. And he was right. And I started playing more and more. And that was Roy Schneider. He's been a, quite an influence in my right. my Americana path. And you've uh, done a version of one of his songs, right? Yes, I did. Um, it's called Carriage. It is on my first CD. And I did... Um, I did what I always do. I take someone else's song when I'm going to cop when I'm going to cover it, and I do what I call an interpretation. Right. It's all there. The bones are there. The words are there. I don't change words. The melody's there, but the arrangement is mine because of my playing style. So. And that's something. If I can interject, that's one of the things. I, I another thing I really like about your music, and we've talked about this too. Uh, when you do a song, it's not just a cover where you're like, I'm just going to do this note for note, try to make it sound like the original. I have a great appreciation for the fact that you, uh, it's almost like listening to a new song. Like you say, I've heard the originals and I've heard what you've done with them. Like you say, it's there, you can tell it's the same song, but the arrangement is so, so different. And in most cases, to me, really, seriously and honestly, your version's better than the original. Thank you. And I, I mean that, I've listened to them a ton of times. and. And I've compared it to the original, and I like what you've done with them. Thank you. So, so go do, ahead. I do spend a lot of time. I right. spend a lot of time on them, and I, I like to get the feel. I try to get into into the heart and mind of the person who wrote the song to, to, to feel what they were trying to say, how mm -hmm. they were trying to say it, and then I take it, put it in my heart, and go, you know, I, I want to show you how I. Feel. The Jamie Michaels song, was that broken? Was that, that was crooked. Car crooked, crooked, crooked. Man, you slayed that. That was just a great Thank you. Great yeah, he, um, that's a great story too. I, I, I became friends with Jamie. I opened, I opened for him at the ACMA back in my very early days. Mm -hmm. Scared to death. But I liked his stuff. He's a wordsmith. Um, really right from the heart. And uh, I opened for him. And that song, we became friends. That song just got to me, and I said, I want to cover that. So I got a hold of him, and I said, I'd like to cover your song. And um, he um, he said, well, I'd be honored, because I've never had anyone cover any of my songs. <clears throat> so I I basically started doing the song, and I made a rough recording of it in MP3, and I sent it to him. I said, here's basically what I'm going to do. And he listened to it, he came back, and he says, sounds really good. Go for it. Well, at the time I had a trio, which was a, a stand-up bass player and a, his wife who sang harmonies. So I took this song and I kept refining it to my style. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, we put the bass on there, bowed, and uh, Maria with the um, harmonies, his wife. Mm -hmm. And Jamie was in town and we invited him to my house for dinner when I lived in Cape Coral. And he came over and and um, my trio was there. 
Maria and Gil were both there. He had his bass. And I said, Jamie, we want to play this for you the way we're going to record it. And he was okay. And it happened that actually uh, Tony Rombolo was there too. Really? From the, from the oh. band. He was there too. Okay. So we did that song for Jamie with the string bass and, and the harmony and all. And he had tears in his eyes. Really? And that was the greatest compliment wow. that yeah. I could have got. Can't fake that. Yeah, and, and he said, he says, not only am I honored you're doing the song, he said, but you did do it. He goes, it, it just brought something out different, like what I was trying to say, but in a different way. And like you said, it's just, just what I do mm -hmm. when I do somebody else's song. I don't feel like I need to be them. Right. I want to play their song, but I don't want to be them. Something else about your music I like. Um, well, you're in the, uh, of course, singer-songwriter realm, but I like all the styles. I mean, like I know you've got at least one song that's a waltz. Yes. You've got some psychedelia stuff like um, sand. Uh, I'm drawing a blank. What is it? It's the song. Uh, Promises made of sand. Yes. Thank you. You've got psychedelica. You've got a country girl with long red hair. Red hair. And I love that song. How much time? So, I mean, and there's blues and just... Well, I don't believe in being a Johnny One note. Um, you can have a style and you can have uh, a feel to your music, but that doesn't mean that everything has to sound the same. Right. Why does it need to sound the same? I mean, every song has its own soul, has its own heart, has its own meaning. So you don't need to make them all sound the same. You know, give them that life. Mm -hmm. Let them have that heartbeat and put them out like that. Um, don't you think it's also more enjoyable for an audience? Yes. If all your songs don't sound basically the That's same. That's right. They don't know what to expect. And they don't sit there and go, okay, here comes another one of those G progression songs. You know, it's just like you can do a G progression song, but it doesn't mean it has to sound like the last G progression song. Right. So uh, on Promises Made of Sand, it's funny you call it psychic. Psychedelia? Yeah, how you yes, how I referred to it. <clears throat> and which, that's one of my favorites, I wrote by the, the way. song, and I was listening to it, and I went, there's something in this song I'm hearing, and it's so familiar, but I can't figure it out. And then it hit me one night. I'd gone to bed, and I was, in my, in my, in, <laughs> in my head, I'm going like, I'm going like this, I'm hearing the song, and then I went, I know what it is. And what it was, was a Donovan song, and um, okay. the way he did his bass line in the song, and the way the the, the hand drums were being played, mm -hmm. and I went, "That's what I'm hearing." So the next day, I got up and I and I started messing with that, and I called up the bass player, and I said, "Here's what I want," and I sent him that song, the Donovan song. I said, "That's the feel I want for the bass, but here's the notes I want." And I cannot read music, so I could not write it out for him. All I could, the best I could do was play it on the guitar and tell him what, where I wanted it to go. And we, we did do it, and we figured it out. And um, he laid down that bass line that I was looking for. And it, it's not a ripoff, mm -hmm. but it has that feel. Right. That Donovan feel from his, um, he was from the Mellow Yellow or the Sunshine Superman album, one of those. One of those two, which he delves into some pretty away from folk music. He was a minstrel. He was a real folky guy. But those two records, he's got jazz and blues being placed on a harpsichord and a celeste. Come on, who does that? So right. anyway, that and then the, and the that that little hand drum yeah. part. Um, yeah, it, it went off in a different place and then I knew it needed something else and I and I had a friend who played flute and she played this flute part but I could not get get her together enough to put her on there so I I told her I was going to use the flute flute line and I got a hold of um cat uh cat see this you get old you lose your mind I know how that is yeah but um she is a world-class flautist, 
and I called her up and I sent her the recording we had, the rough recording I made with the other person. Mm -hmm. And uh, she heard it and she said, I can do that. And I whistle, actually whistled the flute part and laid it out right. and gave it to her. And she took that whistled flute part and laid down the flute part. And we put that in the, in the record and there it was. And it, it just came together. Even when I listen to it, I go, wow. Because I didn't expect it. I really didn't expect that. Yeah. Cat Apple. I'm sorry, Cat. Right. I'm sorry. <laughs> Cat Apple. She's and fairly she, re renowned in her own right, isn't she? Worldwide. She's world class, flautist, um, amazing flute uh, flute player. So we did we did that song and put put it out there and it's a great song. But now when I do it live, of course I don't have the bass, I don't have the the um, the drum part. And what I do is I whistle the flute part when it makes sense. It. Yeah, so it, it it's there. It gives you the idea of you know how that works. But it's it's a song about kind of the music business or any other business you're in where they make you a bunch of promises and it's right. basically a bunch of bullshit. It's just not. Well, I'm glad that song came up actually. Yeah. Like I said, that's one of my. I've got a list of probably five or six favorites of yours, and that's one of them. I like that. Uh, and it's different to me than a lot of your other stuff, and I like that. Like I said, it's not like, I've been to shows where you hear the first two songs, you pretty much heard the whole show. Yeah. And that's a waste of time. But So I appreciate how different your stuff is, but thank you. Uh, before we get going, hey, uh, I'm gonna holler. It was over 50 years ago on Cutter 99. The night was dark, seas were rough, we were bound to save a life. The heartless sea had tossed our ship with me strapped to the bow. I stared through wind and salt and spray and tried to hear a sound. A horn, a bell, a screaming soul who thinks he's at that store hopes deep in his heart he won't see the ocean flow I could almost hear his prayers or was it just the wind then through the blowing ocean just went his chances there. caught a glimpse of life vest floating in the brine it was at that very moment that his eyes met mine. Well, the captain stopped the boat. I reached to grab a hand. The odds were never with us. But we saved. Like I said, when I got down here and um, got into a music scene and got, got involved in the ACMA and did some shows, did my first, recorded my first record, um, solo record. And um, made some friends in the in the music scene, uh, some fellow songwriters and performers, and I learned a lot. I really did. I watched closely when other people play, and I listened carefully to their songs, how they wrote them, and how they make them good. So, so I gleaned a lot of stuff. And in my travels, um, like I said, I met some interesting people, and. Um, and I was writing stuff and playing. And, and I made a friend uh, of a specific drummer. We might as well segue right into that. Yeah, why not? Okay. So I made a friend of a drummer um, who some of you may know, Shannon Larkin. Shannon is the drummer for a band, a little band called Godsmack. They've been around for several years. Um, quite a few platinum and gold records. But uh, I didn't become friends with Shannon like that through music. I became friends with Shannon through a mutual friend who introduced me to him at a bar. And we got to talking about writing. And he had written, um, along with music, he had written some short stories. And I had written some short stories. So we exchanged short stories. Right. And uh, he read mine, I read his, and we discussed them. And we'd get together when he was home, not on tour. And he liked the idea that I wasn't starstruck. He was just another guy who was into music and rode a motorcycle. So 
So we get together, we get on our bikes, and, and at the time I was riding a Harley Davidson. We go ride somewhere and go have lunch, and that was always a funny experience because, for me, he was just a guy riding a bike right. and out having lunch, talking about families, and people would go by and do the you know, that, that right. double take. Like, Whoa, isn't that Shannon Larkin from Gus? How do I act? Just keep going. Uh, can I jump in here? For quick? Mm -hmm. Did you know? Did you know who Godsmack was? Did you know no. this was Godsmack's drummer? No, he was just a guy. To yeah. You. Okay. The music right. itself. I'm. I'm not a metal guy. I'm not a right. uh, headbanger music guy. And uh, I worked in a shop in New York for a little while, a bike shop. And the fellow who introduced me, my friend who introduced me to, to uh, him, his brother actually played with Shannon in a band in a band called Wrathchild America way back in the day. So he was a big fan of God's work. So I'd come in the shop and he'd have that music blasting and I'd go, dude, <laughs> it's Monday morning. I still got leftovers in my head from Saturday night. Right. Let's see if we can like, Whoa! so we'd swap back and forth from classic rock to metal. And so when he introduced me to Shannon and he told me, he goes, yeah, I'm gonna introduce you to Shannon. Shannon who? And he goes, the drummer from Godsmack. I go, who the hell's Godsmack? And that, you know, that band we always listen to in the shop. And I go, oh. And I expected this lunatic. But Shannon is actually a, a very spiritual, down-to-earth guy. So anyway, Shannon and I became good friends and uh, on a friend level, not on a music level. So everything was cool, and I invited him, he and his wife and daughter to my house for dinner. And they came over, and we listened to some Joe Bonamassa and some of this and some of that. And he actually let me listen to some of the cuts from their new, at that point, unreleased record, which was real cool. It pumped them through my stereo. And awesome. And um, he saw the guitar case. And he go, I didn't know you played. And I went, ah, crap. <laughs> because this is a um, this is a rock star. I'm just Ray. I just right. play folk music, Americana. And he says, "Play me something." And there was another "oh crap" moment. Right. I said, "Really?" He goes, "Yeah, play me something. Play me something you wrote." And of course, I'm like at a loss. So I took the guitar, tuned it up, and I went, "All right, and this is you know." This is called Steel on Wood. So I played him Steel on Wood, and he sat there, and he's doing one of these to the beat. Mm -hmm. I got all done, he goes, that was good writing. He says, he says I've got to tell you, it's not my kind of music, but I, he says, I dig your voice. And he says, actually, it was good writing. And I thanked him very much. I said, well, nice to have a rock star blow smoke right. in your direction. So I um, put the guitar away, and. I don't know, it was a few weeks later. I get a call from Shannon, and he goes, um, hey man, what's going on? And I said, so what do you want to do? You want to go take a ride and have lunch? He goes, no, actually, I'm calling you for a different reason. He goes, Tony and I, and I don't know who the hell he's talking about, Tony and I, right. wrote a blues song, and we need somebody to sing it. So me being who I am, I went, oh man. I got you on that because I got a bunch of friends and I know a lot of people that can really sing. You want a guy or a girl? He goes, no, no, no. He says, uh, uh. he says, I'd like you to come down and sing it. And at that moment, everything changed because now <laughs> this doesn't happen all the time. You got a rock star calling me up asking me to come down and sing his song. Come on. Right. So I said, oh, all right. I thought it was a joke. I thought he had my friend in the studio, and I was going to come down and sing, and my friend was going to pop out of the closet laughing. Yeah. So I went down, and I told my wife, and, and I said, I'm going to Shannon's studio to sing a song he wrote, a blues song. So I showed up, and there's this regular-looking guy sitting at the table who happens to be Tony Rombola, the guitar player from God's mm -hmm. Night. And, uh, introduced me to Tony. Quiet, very quiet guy very to himself he's not what you expect from a, a rock star drummer a rock star guitar player. Mm -hmm. so he hands me the lyric sheet and he puts on the music in, the, in this other room right off that room 
I listen to the music and he's kind of scat singing and he's got me scat singing. For those of you who don't know what scat singing is, it's kind of like bebop into words with no words. Just da 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 and do da and do da and da, you know. Right. So we um, we did that. And he goes, yeah, that's it. He goes, and, and here, try to fit the words in. So I'm trying to fit the words in. And he goes, yeah, that, he says, that's it. I like that. He goes, so sing it. So he puts the music on, and he hands me the sheet, gives me a microphone, and I sing it. And he comes in, he comes back in the room. He goes, I'll do it again. He said, but this time, he says, I, I want you to really tear into it. Like, you know, really hit it hard. Like, real loud like. He goes, yeah, sing it like you're on stage. You know, it's like trying to impress somebody. I said, okay. That's when it hit me that I'm thinking, yeah, my friend's out there now because they're going to have me <laughs> do this whole thing and then I'm going to be embarrassed. So it puts it on again and leaves the room and, and I start tearing into this song. The song is called Hell to Pay. And it's actually on the first uh, Apocalypse Blues Review record. So I tear into this thing and halfway through it, Shanna kind of pokes his head and goes, yeah, yeah. That. And I finished the song, and in the other room I hear, and I went, that's got to be Andy. Huh. And I, I walk out, and it's not, it's Tony Rombolo applauding. Mm. And Shannon grabs me and gives me a hug, he goes, that was great. I said, really? He goes, absolutely, man. He says, I heard you sing, but I didn't know you could actually do that. I said, well, thank you. He goes, so how'd you like to be the lead singer for Blue Cross, which was the name of the band before it became the Apocalypse Blues Review, before we signed and everything. And I said, uh, yeah, this shit happens every day. Huh. <laughs> right. I, I don't know, I gotta put you on a list. So, <laughs> so I went home and my wife says, what happened? I said, well, I guess I'm the new lead singer for a band that Tony and Shannon started. She says, oh my God, that's fantastic. And, you know, we didn't, neither one of us really thought of what that was going to entail. This is, this is from zero to a hundred instantaneously. Right. It was not even acceleration, it was transporting from here to here. There was no acceleration at all. It was just from here to here. And the next thing I know, we're in the studio practice and we picked up Brian Carpenter from Blackfoot. He signed on with the band. We made a demo record <clears throat> and um, I wrote I guess I wrote five songs on that first record, first seat, first record. But we did a demo. The demo went to management, who wasn't management yet, and um, he brought it to a record company. And the next thing, I get a phone call saying they have written us a check for X amount of dollars to make our first record. And I was in disbelief that this just went from here to here that quick. So now we're... We're frantically getting all our songs together. We got in the studio, we cut that first record. We had to change our name because Blue Cross, of course. Blue Cross Blue Shield? Yeah, yeah. it was that. And there was another band, I think it was a Christian band up in Canada, using that name. So Shannon, his nickname is Apocalypse, from his days when he used to drink a lot. He's crazy. So, um, we ended up calling the band the Apocalypse Blues Review, and we cut that first record and went on tour. Um, and we we had a pretty good tour. It wasn't anything crazy. It was we cut it back a lot, but it was good. It was fun. It was an experience traveling thousands of miles from the van to go right. play in these places, these little places. But was that the same tour I saw you on down in I think Fort Myers? Probably. I think so. Probably, and uh, we did the one tour, then we cut a second record, and uh, we went on tour again. We toured with Kenny Wayne Shepherd. We did um, uh, blues festivals. Played a bunch of different places all over the all over the country, really, in a lot of different states, and um, and then Godsmack went on tour, and it kind of got put on a back yeah. burner when Scott's back went on tour, you know, Shannon and Tony had time for the band and so it kinda did that and then Shannon got some ideas taking a band in a totally different direction. Right. And yeah, the second album was the second totally album different. was totally different and 
at the time, Shannon was kind of exercising his his creativity and and, and what he wanted to do in his art. And he, he thought he could do that. The record company didn't really agree and they weren't as happy with the second record, so. And um, Shannon went off and did the next album and put a lot of money into it too, but it, it didn't really do what he thought it would. It was some great musicianship. You weren't on that one, right? No, the, the ne then I, I left the band. Um, Shannon wanted to move on with a, with a little different thing and that wasn't my thing. I was blues rock. So but it wasn't me. And um, he picked up another singer and they, they did another record. It didn't really do much. But I have to say, again, the musicianship in that record was amazing. Really cool stuff. Shannon's art is really cool. But even Shannon admitted that where we were on that first record was where we needed to, to kind of stay in that group. Yeah. Blues rock, live band, yeah. four piece, three instruments in a vault, anyway. And the show was great. The sh yeah. The oh. show, I saw, well, I saw you two nights. You played two nights down there. And wasn't that Fort Myers? Must have been. Yeah. But it was, and blues rock is just such a great, genre yeah. for live music i mean jesus christ that was a great show yeah, people loved it we we had a following we still have a following we don't have a band um i use my stage name rayford john i mean i'm on facebook and i still have people contacting me you know are you guys ever going to do it again and honestly even after shannon did this record the next record and he's he, he actually tony has dropped out of the band and he's putting together some new stuff with some other musicians, and it's really, really cool stuff. I, I can't say enough, it's cool stuff, I've heard it. Um, whether it's going, going to sell or not, that's to be seen, mm -hmm. but Shannon feels like this is his art, and what he's doing now is his art. And even he has admitted to me that it was kind of not the right direction. <clears throat> for the for the review for blues review right so you know it, it it is where it is now he'd like to do some more shows and i would too um, i talked to you one time and there was a possibility of that. yeah is there still a possibility there still is a possibility of it is um, it just shows or is it a cd too or? uh i doubt there'll be another record but we do want to do more shows um it's hard to pull it all together again because godsmack is touring now they're they're promoting right. their new record so Again, that's their that's their concentration. That's his band. So anyway, I've gone back to well, I never did leave it. My Americana. I'm writing more songs. You're working on a CD, aren't you? Of your I'm working stuff? on a second CD. I have my first record is out. It's called. Um, oh my goodness! How much time? How much time? And I'm thinking of the new one. I've been trying to work a name for the new. How It's Called How Much Time, which is one of the songs on the record. And um, that's been out for a while. You can get that anywhere. Oh, I should plug my webpage. Yeah, go ahead. The webpage is steelonwood.com. One word, steelonwood.com. And if you go there, you're going to hear um, some new stuff, some old stuff, some covers, interpretations, as we discussed, um, some live stuff I did during COVID. There's a link to some videos, to some live shows I did, and um, also it'll tell you where I'm going to be playing and when, uh, which I don't do a lot of shows at. I believe in quality, not quantity. I'm not in it for the money. I like doing live shows. It's my best, the best feel I have is when I do live stuff, but I'd rather play to a room with 10 people that really want to hear me then play in a room of 50 people that are screaming and shouting over the music. All right. Because that's not what I do. So, um, so that's where I'm at now. What's, um, what's going on, uh, or is anything going on? You were trying to do another blues rock band locally, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. We have a, I have a friend here who put something out on Facebook um, wanting some people who wanted to get involved with blues. And I contacted him. We had a long, long discussion. His name is Robbie. Um, Robbie's a really great guitar player. Uh, he's been he's been in it for a lot of years. He played up north, up in New York, and uh, in the cities. 
good bands up there. Got a lot of influence, got a lot of experience. He really knows his way around the guitar and blues and blues rock. So I got to meet him. He heard me sing. He really liked it. And uh, we are looking for, and we've been through a few people now, we're looking for a drummer and a bass player. That's all. Possibly keyboards somewhere in the future. But it's hard to find people locally that want to commit to that kind of a band. Um, they, the music scene here is kind of strange. People want to get out and make money. And of course, everybody wants to make money. But right. That's all they want to really do is get out there and do gigs so they're making money. Where what we're trying to do is, to, is more on a creativity level. We want to get out there and, and do stuff that feed in our soul. And it's giving people something else to listen to besides the same old stuff. Right. I mean, not, there's no put down. There is no put down. And make sure you know that. There is no put down to any bands here. There's some really good musicians in this area great singers, and there's also some mediocre people, but that's right. the way it is. Everywhere. Everywhere. So it's a kind of music that's being played. They, they play to entertain the people that are in the bars, that are drinking and having a good time, that might want to dance, and that's what they're doing. We want to get out there and show them. There's a little different music. There's something there that's it's got some power. It's really powerful music. Blues rock is powerful stuff. And we want to do that. So Robbie and I are, are looking. We've got another drummer right now on a burner and um, another bass player we're going to try out. And hopefully we get something to gel. We've got songs we're working on together. Um, it's just a matter of finding the right two people and we're going to have a band. And then we will be playing here locally and then we'll spread out and, and and play around. So, has anybody ever accused you of trying to be the next Tom Jones? Me? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. No, I wouldn't mind having being the next Tom Jones owner of that bank account. But. Right. So, talking about Robbie, I, I got to tell you this. Um, I don't know if you've heard this before. But we're about the same age, so you you probably know who this guy is. I'm going to mention. Like I said, I met Robbie when you were doing a show at the uh, Circle Theater. Yes. He was there. He was in the row in front of me and a little off to the right. And I was looking at him and I told Ramona, I said, that looks just like Waddy Wachell. And I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right. He's a 70s session guy. He played on Edge of 17, okay. Stevie Nicks. Yeah. Looks exactly like him to me. So much so I told her and she Googles Waddy and shows his picture. And it still looks just like him. I said, that's him. That, what's he doing here? Does Ray know this guy? Do you, are you familiar with him? In no, the 70s, I don't know the guy. he was a side man, but he was a super big, he played with the biggest people. You know, like, like I said, he toured with Stevie yeah. Nicks, those kind of people. He was in that rare air. And I even, I, I even went up to him and said, are you Waddy Bichelle? Of course he wasn't. He should have said yes. Yeah, he should have. And I would have right. believed him because yeah, he looks right. exactly like him. So anyway, but he told me a lot of people, he said he hadn't heard that one in a while, but he said he has heard that one, and other people have asked him if it was other people. I don't remember the other ones that I said, but to me, you should ask him. He looks exactly like him. You should Google one of your and, and look. And give that a look. But um, so. But that's where we're at now, which, like I said, we're trying to do that. Um, that's on a burner. Uh, my next CD's on a burner. I've got almost all the songs basically recorded. Uh, COVID kind of slowed things down. Right. I couldn't get to the studio. Studios in Fort Myers where I usually record and uh, or in my own studio at home. But that's where I do all the mixing and all with my the engineer. So it's been on a back burner and now I've got to get it back out again. I don't want to get it finished. So you've uh, got a lot of coals in the fire right now. Yeah, I do. A lot of irons in the fire. Yeah, right I do. I do. I'm trying to live as much life as I can, and that's what it's all about. My uh, wife and I used to travel on motorcycle. We did that. We just did a little tour around Florida, had some fun, enjoyed it, and um, kind of the whole COVID thing kind of put a squash on our travels. Things got more expensive. Things got hard to find motels, et cetera, et cetera. So we had to 
Like enough. everybody else, we had to kind of bite the bullet on that. I know you're a big fan of Guy Clark. We talk yeah, about that yeah. a lot. Is, is there anybody, um, either locally or nationally, that has your attention right now? Uh, uh, well, nationally, it's always been people like Guy Clark, Richard Schindel, for his writing. Jeez, uh, there's so many, and and I'd have to pick and choose songs. Right. There's some John Prine stuff that I really like, and not your everybody's playing those song songs. I mean, there's different ones. Right. Um, local musicians in this particular area, I gotta say, there's one band that stands out, Hard Candy. Hard Candy. Yeah, Aaron, you did a thing with Aaron, right. an interview with that Aaron. That was the last one before this one. Yeah, yeah. and and she um, she caught my ear a few years ago. They were playing here in, in Sebring, and I, I just went there on a fluke just to see what this was all about. And I gave one listen to her singing, and I went, she got the goods. So I went and talked to her, and I said, listen, I'm going to mention, if you want, let me mention your name to somebody. And, they, they might want to hear you sing. And it took a little time, and finally got her to my house, and him to my house, and he heard her, and he took her down to Fort Myers and started to try to record with her, and then uh, turned her over to Dave Fortman. Dave Fortman is with Ugly Kid Joe, and with um, his producer as well. And she probably told you the whole story with that, too. Yeah, and, uh, and he did Evanescence, too. Right? Yeah, yes, yes, he's big. Right. He knows his he knows his shit. So um, he did something with her. It's out on it's out on um, on Facebook and YouTube and everything now. Great song, really great song, catchy. So um, you can see she, I knew she had the goods, and I told her. And I said I don't mention people to other people because I want to be embarrassed. So I won't do it unless I'm sure, and I'm sure. I said I'm going to tell you about these people. Just listen to them. Do what they say. They know what they're doing. She did, and she's she's got a shot. That door is open. That door is definitely open for her. So, mm -hmm. but the band itself, I've watched that band evolve. And you know, you don't always see a lot of local bands evolve. They just change players. They do the same old music, same old gigs. But I have watched them evolve and get tighter and tighter. And just the last time I saw it, yeah, they're good. They're really right. good. So, there's your plug. <laughs> yeah, she's gonna appreciate that. Yeah. And she plugged you too. When we yeah. talked to her, yeah. she mentioned uh, that she yeah. worked with you and you showed some interest in her. So for you, um, down the road, have you thought about getting involved in the other part of the industry, developing talent and that sort of thing? Not really. Um, I'm at a point in life where. And the only way I can put it is this. I don't want to try that hard. Right. I just want to, I want to enjoy life. Just do your own Enjoy thing. what I do and make sure I have time to do the things I enjoy. Right. Because if you start getting deeply involved in something, and there's a lot of it out there, then you, you get kind of locked in. It becomes a job. And I don't want to turn the thing that I love the most, besides my wife, right. into work. All right, I can understand that. And with that, we're uh, we're about at the end of this. Okay. We've about they're about to throw us out of here. <laughs> I think we've reached our limit on. They ran out beer. of beer. Yeah, they ran out of beer, so we're not sticking around. We're not sticking around <laughs> here. But anyway, so again, thank you very much, Ray, for your thank time. Thank you, Jim. Very, very much. Okay, now we got the privilege of having Ray Strabone do a couple of his songs, and I wanted to introduce this one because right at the very beginning I said uh, when I first met Ray, it was in a coffee house, and he played this song, and it had just this, this killer riff that I loved. Uh, it's a really haunting thing, and in fact, for those of you who will know what I'm talking about, I always thought this should have been in this movie called Jonah Hex, which had a soundtrack by Mastodon. To me, this is just like... Western Gothic, so it's just got this really cool, eerie, repeating riff, and I loved it. It's always been. It's one of the first songs I ever heard by Ray. Still my favorite song by Ray. So having said that, Ray, 
Take it away. From hell's hole Saying I woke up this morning With the blue Right to my soul Right to my soul See those blue shoes coming Better take hold to your heart Yeah, if you see those blue shoes coming Better take hold to your heart They're gonna hammer out a bad beat That's when you're blue We'll start Say so gonna hammer out a backbeat That's when you're blue We'll 